the one remaining male heir to the thrones of England, Scotland and Ireland, sets off with only a handful of companions across France, into Spain, all to win the hand of the Catholic Spanish Infanta. A good idea? Spoiler alert, it's not. Welcome to the English Civil Wars, the brand new series from History Workshops. In this series, we will be discussing everything and anything to do with the War of the Three Kingdoms. We'll be doing videos on the causes of the conflict, the main characters, the battles, large and small, the lives of the average soldier, the barber surgeon, weapons displays, and so much more. If you missed our previous episode on the Britain of James I and Charles Prince of Wales's younger years, click here or follow the link in the description box below. So King James I has been on the throne for just over 10 years, and it has been peaceful and turbulent in equal measure. In that time, he has become the first monarch to reign over England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. He has escaped being blown up by the gunpowder plot. He has maintained the anti-Catholic policies of the Tudor state. He has continued to repopulate Ireland with Protestant English and Scottish. Yet he has also seen his eldest and favourite son die of a fever. He has married his daughter off to a Palatinate prince and has begun the vast task of creating the King James Bible, not to mention falling in love with the dazzling George Villiers. A busy few years. Yet James was now looking to the future, and in particular, his one remaining son, Charles, Prince of Wales. Who was he to marry? James did not have an easy task in choosing a suitable suitor, though. As an isolated Protestant state, Protestant princesses were few and far between. Marrying a Catholic would need the support of the Pope, which could easily ignite a pyre of discontent from Parliament and the people. Yet despite these potential problems, in 1614, James began negotiations to wed Charles to the Spanish Infanta. Almost immediately, the expected opposition made itself heard. There was no real surprise. After all, England had been at war with Spain within many people's lifetimes. Memory and legend still remembered the threat posed by the Spanish Armada in 1588, and all too many held painful memories of the disastrous counter-armada sent by England in 1589. And on top of the xenophobia of the Spanish was the disgust of Catholicism, the Inquisition, the Jesuits and the rule of the Pope. But James had his reasons for this match to go ahead. Reasons that would seem familiar when we discuss the years when his son was on the throne. In return for ceasing attacks on Spanish ships in Spanish-American waters, Spain would promise to not interfere in James's Protestant plans in Ireland. But more importantly, James would net a dowry of, wait for it, £500,000, over £100 million in today's money. If this were to go ahead, James would be free from the dependency on Parliament for funds. Remind you of anyone? The King's advisers argued over this proposed marriage. Many reminded him of the Catholic Spanish marriages involving Catherine of Aragon to Henry VIII and Philip II to Queen Mary. Neither had proved overly successful. Why should this one to Maria Anna be any different? But unfortunately for the King, all his plans, the marriage included, took a dark turn. In 1618, the Thirty Years' War erupted. This religious war was to terrorise Central Europe and see massacres and genocide and horrific set-piece battles as the Catholic and Protestant powers bled each other white. As the war progressed in savagery, James wanted to be known as a peacemaker and was determined not to be drawn in. Instead, he hoped that a marriage alliance could help smooth matters out. But despite his best efforts, by the 1620s, anti-Catholic feelings were running so high that he was forced to summon a parliament to assist his daughter and her husband, a Palatinate prince, in their fight during the Thirty Years' War. In classic British parliamentary style, they called for a vigorous persecution of the war, whilst at the same time not offering enough funds to do so. On top of the problems the war was causing in James's marriage arrangements, he knew that the present Pope, Paul V, would not offer a dispensation to allow the Infanta to marry a Protestant prince. In 1621, Sir Edward Cope added fuel to the fire by forwarding a petition 
calling for a full persecution of the war to continue anti-Catholic laws and that the Prince of Wales was to marry a Protestant. When James heard of the petition, he is said to have cried, God, give me patience. James wrote, we cannot with patience endure our subjects to use such anti-monarchical words to us concerning their liberties, except they had subjoined that they were granted unto them by the grace and favour of our predecessors. With backing from Buckingham and the Spanish ambassador Gondomar, James ripped the protest out of the record book and dissolved Parliament. But outside of royal and government circles, anti-Catholic and anti-Spanish sentiment was running at fever pitch. The Puritan press sprung into action, publishing scandalous tales of anyone connected to the Spanish match. These vile and unsubstantiated attacks were labelled as defamation, forgery and partisan distortion. But in the same year for James, there was finally a chink of light. In Rome, Gregory XV became the new Pope and was immediately more amenable to the idea of a Catholic and Protestant marriage, if accompanied by the reduction of penal laws against Catholics in the British Isles. That year, 1621, James did not sit back and let his opposition pull his cause apart. He sent out a royal decree, making it a crime to speak out or write against the Spanish match, or even the state of royal affairs. A certain John Everard, who preached against the match, was punished with six months in Gatehouse Prison. In 1622, amidst this political, religious and military unrest, the unbelievable happened. The sole male heir of James's kingdom was allowed to travel abroad into hostile lands with only a handful of companions. Disguised with fake wigs and beards, Charles and Buckingham departed England. Before passports, they travelled incognito as Thomas and John Smith. Genius. This mad, dangerous and totally unheard of act was for one thing, to win the hand of a Spanish bride, whose brother was the most powerful man in the world, Philip IV of Spain. Before they even headed for Spain, they decided to pop into Paris for a bit of sightseeing, and why not? They only had a cool £30,000 burning a hole in their britches. As soon as they arrived, they treated themselves to periwigs so they could gain access to the French royal family. From a balcony with other sightseers, they watched the French king, Louis XIII, eating, and the queen and her ladies practicing their dancing in readiness for a mask. But they didn't stop for long. They soon mounted their horses once more and headed for the Spanish border. Their journey to Madrid seems to have gone without a hitch, and their disguises were not rumbled. Arriving in Madrid with their clothes and boots sweat-stained and covered in dust, they searched for a mysterious house with seven chimneys. This was the house which belonged to the English ambassador, one Sir John Digby, the first Earl of Bristol. We can only imagine the shock suffered by Digby, here at his house, wanting to gain access to the most powerful family in the world, was the sole heir to the British crown, in nothing but his riding clothes. You didn't just drop in on the Habsburgs, this court, this royal court, was the centre of culture, the most formal, the most pious, and this court took etiquette incredibly seriously. It ran on order, religious devotion and dignity. Just appearing to grab a bride would certainly be a shock to the Spanish, perhaps a nasty shock. But Charles was determined to blow away the cobwebs of court niceties. He was here to sweep his potential bride off her feet and cared not a jot that he was breaching all diplomatic protocol. It is easy to think that Charles wanted to emulate his father, James I. When James had been married by proxy in 1589, his wife Anna of Denmark, only 14 at the time, had set sail to join him in Scotland. Unfortunately, a storm in the North Sea swept the small royal flotilla to the north and forced them to land in Norway. James distraught put together a rushed rescue mission and personally sailed to Norway and rescued his young bride. Did Charles see his madcap dash across Europe to surprise the Spanish Infanta in the same light? Well, very soon after their initial shock, the Spanish began preparations for Charles to meet Maria Anna. 
but she and the court would need some considerable time before they met. Villiers travelled to the Alcazar, a forbidding palace and fortress, to plan the meeting. To begin with, Charles was to spy the Infanta through a chink in a carriage, and she was to wear a blue ribbon so she would stand out amongst her ladies. Even though this initial meeting was just a fleeting glimpse, the Spanish welcome for Charles was incredible. His father James had been very clever. In the introduction letter he had given Charles, James had titled Charles as Sworn King of Scotland. This meant that he was not to be treated like some prince of the blood, but a king, an equal to Philip IV, and to have the same access and respect given. Because of this, wherever Charles went, he was given a royal welcome, including huge parades, and he was fated alongside the King of Spain. It was here, under vast canopies of state, with an adoring population, that he would begin to feel what absolute monarchy and the divine right of kings really meant. Wherever the two men went, they were treated with the utmost respect, and every whim was catered for without murmur. This level of respect was shown in the Alcazar, where Charles was given a golden key, which allowed him unrestricted access to the king's own private apartments. Charles's stay, which was to last eight months, was full of enjoyment for the young prince. He and the small English band were entertained every day. They went hunting, they had picnics, there were masks, ball fights, music, pageants, fireworks, and perhaps the most enjoyable for Charles, a private tour of King Philip's 2,000 paintings. Charles's lifelong obsession with art and collecting was surely ignited here. In particular, he fell in love with two of Philip's Titians, Emperor Charles V with Hound and the racy woman in fur coat. He loved this collection so much that he actually dropped several not subtle hints with the king that he wanted to take these back with him. Charles's love of art, paintings and creating his own royal collection would be an expensive hobby, the cost of which would alienate many of his countrymen later when he was king. On top of all the entertainment, Charles was treated to a tour of the colossal palace slash monastery of the Escorial. This intimidating and mighty structure must have only underlined Charles's ideal vision of the power of majesty, the true glory of monarchy, and the deference that should be owed him when he was king. But despite the celebrations and the outward appearance of friendship, not to mention the huge expense the Spanish occurred, not all was as it seemed. The negotiations were going on a little bit too long. James I had written from England, saying he was afraid that the Spanish may be trying to keep Charles hostage. Others believed the Spanish were delaying for so long to keep British soldiers out of the war that was engulfing Central Europe. James instructed his son to agree to any Spanish demands on the marriage, promise anything that would let Charles leave. Buckingham himself was wearing out his welcome as well. He had quarrelled with the Spanish chief minister, the Count of Olivares. After Charles and Buckingham had returned to England, Olivares actually sent a demand to Parliament that Buckingham be executed for his behaviour whilst in Madrid. One way or another, Charles and his small group managed to leave Spain, with the marriage signed and already being prepared. But Charles, and more importantly King James, were not willing to go through with it. The concessions the Spanish were requiring for the reductions of Catholic penal laws would have not been accepted by the British public. When Charles and Buckingham arrived back in England without the Infanta, they were met with delight. But perhaps the greatest relief was that Charles had not been converted to a Catholic in his eight month absence. Some initial plans, however, were put in motion for the marriage and to receive the Spanish Infanta, but none were carried through. Questions were raised as to which houses would be suitable for the princess's households. St James's Palace and Somerset House were highlighted early as possible residences. But these residences would not only have to accommodate the new Princess of Wales, but also her Catholic household, Catholic priests and confessors. This would not have set well with the public. But this was all part of the marriage contract. Anna Maria would have to be provided for in all matters of religion, to have new chapels constructed, as well 
as public Catholic churches large enough to hold all necessary ceremonies and burials. With the level of anti-Catholicism in early 17th century Britain, it is hardly surprising that the marriage did not happen. The final decision was made by James's Privy Council, and it was to finally reject the Spanish terms in 1624. Charles, though, like a true politician, took the blame for the failure of the marriage negotiations himself. No, he didn't. Lord Bristol, the English ambassador in Madrid, who had been stunned at the unannounced arrival of the Prince of Wales, became the scapegoat. Unsurprisingly, or not, he was recalled back to England, his reputation in tatters. The embarrassment of Charles and Buckingham must have been extreme, because not only did they blame Bristol, but ordered him to remain on his estates, and if that was not bad enough, they imprisoned him in the Tower of London. Charles didn't know this at the time, but for the troubled years he was about to face as king, Charles could well have done with a talented and loyal public servant like Bristol. It wasn't until after the First English Civil War had started that the two men were able to patch things up. So now, back in England, and the blame for a failed mission deflected, like a flash, proposed marriage preparations became hasty war preparations. Charles and Buckingham now surprisingly called for war against the Spanish Empire. At a stroke, James's policy of royal marriages and creating a balance of power in Europe was in tatters. The two young men, angered by their treatment in Spain, now pressured the king into declaring war. Accompanied by an outpouring of heightened levels of anti-Catholicism, Charles and Buckingham now began to dictate foreign policy instead of the king. War was now not far away. In our next episode, James I, the philosopher king, passes away, and his one remaining son becomes Charles I, the monarch who will forever be tied to the English civil wars, and to be the only British monarch executed by his parliament. Charles will declare war, not only on the great power that was Spain, but also Britain's oldest enemy, France. He will lose his most trusted friend and advisor, and will also begin to plant the seeds of civil war. On top of this, he will marry, not to a Spanish princess, but a French one, and a Catholic one as well. And yes, this will cause problems. If you missed our previous episode on the Britain of James I and Charles's younger years, click here or follow the link in the description box below. As always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to get more of our content and of course, God save the King.